This is part two of our video series on Sakshay Waman in Peru. If you haven't seen part one, I encourage you to check that out. It's linked below. But basically, we went over some of the Incan histories regarding the site and the area of Cusco itself. We looked into some of the writings from early Spanish chroniclers that relay the Incan oral histories, and all of them speak of worldwide floods, subterranean civilizations, and a prehistoric world of advanced giant-sized humans, much like we see in other mythologies. These giants were generally said to be a race that was created before humans, and that they inhabited the same regions and cities as modern humans. But they were destroyed and turned to stone by Vir Kocha and this massive flood he sent. All that remains of them are their megalithic ruins in places like Tiwanaku and Oyentai Tambo, and their stone bodies which many believe to still be visible today. After this flood, some of the giants survived in caves and on ships, but the stories say they returned, and many wars were fought defending the ancient kingdoms of Peru. Here's one story from the Spanish chroniclers that is a retelling of a well-known Incan legend of giants. It reads, There are, however, reports concerning giants in Peru, who landed on the coast at the point of Santa Elena, within the jurisdiction of the city Puerto Viejo, which require notice. I will relate what I have been told, without paying attention to the various versions of the story current among the vulgar, who always exaggerate everything. The natives relate the following tradition, which had been received from their ancestors from very remote times. They are arrived on the coast in boats made of reeds, as big as large ships, a party of men of such size that from the knee downwards their height was as great as an entire height of an ordinary man, though he might be of good stature. Their limbs were all in proportion to the deformed size of their bodies, and it was a monstrous thing to see their heads, with hair reaching to their shoulders. Their eyes were as large as small plates, they had no beards, and were dressed in the skins of animals. Others only in the dress which nature gave them, and they had no women with them. When they arrived at this point they made a sort of village, and even now the sites of their houses are pointed out. But as they found no water, in order to remedy the want, they made some very deep wells, works which are truly worthy of remembrance. For such are their magnitude, that they certainly must have been executed by very strong men. They dug these wells in the living rock until they met with the water. And then they lined them with masonry from top to bottom in such sort that they will endure for many ages. The water in these wells is very good and wholesome, and always so cold that it is very pleasant to drink. Having built their village and made their wells or cisterns where they could drink, these great men, or giants, consumed all the provisions they could lay their hands upon in the surrounding country, insomuch that one of them ate more meat than fifty of the natives of the country could. As all the food they could find was not sufficient to sustain them, they killed many fish in the sea with nets and other gear. They were detested by the natives, because in using their women they killed them, and the men also in another way. But the Indians were not sufficiently numerous to destroy this new people who had come to occupy their lands. They made great leagues against them, but met with no success. All the natives declare that God our Lord brought upon them a punishment in proportion to the enormity of their offense. While they were all together engaged in their accursed, a fearful and terrible fire came down from heaven with a great noise, out of the midst of which there issued a shining angel with a glittering sword, with which at one blow they were all killed, and the fire consumed them. There only remained a few bones and skulls which God allowed to remain without being consumed by the fire as a memorial of this punishment. This is what they say concerning these giants. And we believe the account, because in this neighborhood they have found and still find enormous bones. I have heard from the Spaniards, who have seen part of a double tooth, that they judge the whole tooth would have weighed more than a half of a butcher's pound. 
They also had seen another piece of shin bone, and it was marvelous to relate how large it was. These men are witnesses to the story, and the site of the village may be seen, as well as the wells and cisterns made by the giants. I am unable to say from which direction they came, because I do not know. In this year, 1550, I, being in the city of the kings, heard that when the most illustrious Don Antonio de Mendoza was viceroy and governor of New Spain, they found certain bones of men who must have been even larger than these giants. I have also heard that previously they discovered in a most ancient tomb in the city of Mexico, or in some other part of that kingdom, certain bones of giants. From all this we may gather that as so many persons saw and affirmed these things, these giants really did exist. All these Indians also eat human flesh. Some of them use bows and arrows and others staves, clubs, darts, and long lances. Towards the north of Cali there is another province, bordering on that of Anzerma, the natives of which are called Choncos. They are so big that they look like small giants, with broad shoulders, robust frames, and great strength. Their faces are large and heads narrow, for in this province, in that of Kinabaya, and in other parts of the Indies, when a baby is born they force the head into the shape they may choose, thus some grow up without an occiput, others with a raised forehead, and others with a very long head. This is done when the child is just born, by means of certain small boards fastened with ligatures. The women are treated in the same way. The Chancos, both men and women, go naked and barefoot, with only a cloth between their legs, made of not cotton, but of bark, taken from a tree and made very fine and soft, about a yard long, and two palmos broad. They fight with great lances and darts, and occasionally they leave their provinces to wage war with their neighbors of Anzerma. When the Marshal Robledo entered Cartago for the last time, which he ought to not have done, that he might be received as the lieutenant of the judge, Miguel Diaz Armendariz, certain Spaniards were sent to guard the road between Anzerma and the city of Cali. These men encountered certain of these Chancos who had come down to kill a Christian, who was going to take some goats to Cali. And one or two of the Indians were killed. The Spaniards were astonished at their great size. End quote. These giant statured people were said in some other stories to have been eventually driven south, most likely giving rise to the seven to eight foot tall Patagones that were also reported by early explorers. So maybe this star fort site of Soxay Waman was really built by this predecessor race of giants. Megalithic structures that share the same stone features were said by the Inca to have been left behind by these people and the hill of Sacsayhuaman was one of the first places the ancient Cusco people settled. This would make perfect sense because they could easily build primitive houses around the megalithic ruins and use them as walls or foundations. There's no way Pachacuti's people could have constructed this in a mere 33 year reign. It would take years of planning and even longer to transport and perfectly shape every multi-ton stone all in the rough terrain of southern Peru and without the use of the wheel. Even the Spanish could not believe they did this without the help of spirits or sorcery. Garcilaso de la Vega wrote, A Spanish monk who recently visited Peru told me on his return that he would never have believed what people tell about this fortress, Soxe Woman, if he hadn't seen it with his own eyes because it is even more difficult to imagine that one can say, and that in reality, it seemed hardly possible that such a project could have been successfully carried out without the help of the evil one. Those were his very words. If we think, too, that this incredible work was accomplished without the help of a single machine, is it too much to say that it represents an even greater enigma than the seven wonders of the world? because one sees quite well how the Great Wall of Babylon, the Colossus of Rhodes, or the Egyptian pyramids were constructed, with the combined forces of time and countless workers accumulating year after year, the necessary materials, whether it was a question of brick and cement as in Babylon, 
of bronze as in Rhodes, or of stone and mortar as for the pyramids. All of that can be imagined, because with time, the vastest undertakings can be carried through, if they are merely a matter of repeating gestures and labor of which we know men are capable. But on the contrary, how may we explain the fact that these Peruvian Indians were able to split, carve, lift, carry, hoist, and lower such enormous blocks of stone, which are more like pieces of a mountain than building stones? And that they accomplished this, as I said before, without the help of a single machine or instrument. An enigma such as this one cannot be easily solved without seeking the help of magic particularly when one recalls the great familiarity of these people with devils." End quote. So who were these people that built the original site on Sacsayhuaman? And does the site share the same advanced technological features we see with other star fort structures? The geometric pattern itself is telling of advanced architectural knowledge, but the site also has some other telling features that point to it having been equipped with technology that surpasses anything historians say was possible in the ancient world. First, the water systems and irrigation. In fact, this whole complex was once surrounded by moats, just like we see with the star forts in Europe. A large circular reservoir sat at the valley of the hill. And there's evidence of water erosion all around the site. And many of the stonework creates channels for water to flow around the structure and into the reservoir and baths. This style of masonry worked perfect for holding water because the stones fit so tightly together. It is possible that the whole place was built to redirect water, just like many other star forts all over Europe. In our star fort theory video, we went over how these structures were often built on the highest point in the region, and many have theorized they were used as flood walls. In Soxai Waman's case, it is indeed on the highest hill in the region. And of course, we have the story of the flood as previously discussed. The technology incorporated in the star fort, some say, is meant to terraform and move water around using advanced geometry and physics to do so. Star forts would usually be placed along waterways, and similar to how Tesla valves work, the shape and inner structures of the star fort and surrounding moats would force the water to push a certain direction with its own energy creating entirely new rivers and possibly draining the land after these floods. A good example of this is in the Netherlands, where we find some of the most star forts on Earth. The Dutch have kept this advanced ancient technology and used these geometric shapes along with their windmills and technology like the Da Vinci meter lock, water wheel, etc. They terraform the entire coastal region creating fertile farmland, and of course, the sea between England and the Netherlands was once a huge landmass, only submerged around 6500 BC. So the people in this region were forced, like the people of Peru, to acquire or learn this knowledge or drown, like their stories say many others did. So Soxai Waman could have very well been this same sort of creation we see in Europe. But it seems despite their efforts, the people who built this star fort perished in the flood and left behind nothing but ruins. But to this day, the site still supplies fresh spring water that is said by many to be some of the most delicious and purest on earth. And in ancient times, it supplied the entire village and filled the moats, baths, reservoirs, and waterways that surrounded Sacsayhuaman. And this magical water may have even had a hand in their above average lifespans and tall stature. The chroniclers say this about the springs. Inside this triple enclosure, three tall towers were erected on a large, narrow ground. The largest of them was called Mayak Marka, which means the round tower. It was built over a clear, abundant spring, fed by underground canalizations, concerning which nobody knew from where or how they came. The Inca and the members of his supreme council were always the only ones who knew such secrets as these. And then Pedro de Cieza de Leon wrote, describing Soxe Woman, Above these lines of defense there is a long narrow platform, on which were three strong towers. The principal one was in the center and called Moyak Marca, the round tower. In it there was a fountain of excellent water, 
brought from a distance underground. The Indians know not whence. End quote. Actually, there are many sites around Peru that have these intricately made springs that both collect and keep water pure as it flows to the needed destination. These springs include perfect geometric shapes, tunnels, ancient methods of pumping and using gravity, and they're almost all pre-Inca. Nobody really knows how most of these were created or how the people came up with this technology. This inner round tower that housed the spring was also very significant. All throughout the Americas, the natives would create these round-shaped buildings in the center of their religious centers and temples. We see this at sites in North America, among the Mesoamericans, and at other much older sites in Peru. These circular enclosures often have astrological purposes and act as observatories or mimic celestial bodies similar to the way the enclosures at Gobekli Tepe are said to work. This room was reserved for the emperor, and only he knew of its inner workings and purpose. And then there are the tunnels underneath Sacsayhuaman. The starfort structures we find in Europe and the Americas almost always contain a network of tunnels underneath the landscape, sometimes reaching miles long, traveling under entire cities and even bodies of water. These were said to be for military purposes, but in many cases the tunnels extended deeper, and further than any military operation would need or be able to construct. And in the ones we find in Europe, the tunnels often connect to ancient caves and mining tunnels, like in France with the catacombs, and in the cities of London, Rome, and many more. And of course we find these exact features underneath the site of Sacsayhuaman, except in this case they were built by the Inca or pre-Inca people. In fact, the people of Peru and the Andes mountain region have been creating tunnels for thousands of years to better traverse the mountainous landscape. Nearly all Incan monuments have tunnels near and around them, usually leading all the way back to Cusco, right where Sacsayhuaman is. This includes tunnels leading to the ancient site of Tiwanaku, where the Incas say they originated, where the ruins from the original people exist. Here's an interesting passage I found about Tiwanaku. The famous ruins of Tiwanaku, generally considered to be long anterior to the time of the Incas, appear, like those at Ollantay Tambo, to be remains of edifices which were never completed. Garcilaso de la Vega gives the following account of Tiwanaku. Amongst other works in this place, one of them is a hill, made artificially and so high that the fact of its having been made by man causes astonishment, and that it might not be loosened. It was built upon great foundations of stone. It is not known why this edifice was made. In another part, away from the hill, there were two figures of giants carved in stone, with long robes down to the ground and caps on their heads, all well worn by the hand of time, which provides their great antiquity. There is also an enormous wall of stone, so large that the greatest wonder is caused to imagine how human force could have raised them to the place where they are now. For there are no rocks nor quarries within a great distance, from whence they could have been brought. In other parts there are grand edifices, and what causes most astonishment are some great doorways of stone. Some of them are made out of a single stone. The marvel is increased by their wonderful size, for some of them were found to measure 30 feet in length, 15 in breadth, and 6 in depth. And these stones with their doorways are all of one single piece, so that it cannot be understood with what instruments or tools they can have been worked. The natives say that all these edifices were built before the time of the Incas, and that the Incas built the fortress of Cusco in imitation of them. They know not who erected them, but have heard their forefathers say that all these wonderful works were completed in a single night. The ruins appear never to have been finished, but to have been merely the commencement of what the founders intended to have built." End quote. The caves underneath Sacsayhuaman could have been the caves the oral histories of the Incas were speaking of where man took refuge during the flood. So this site in Peru literally has all the same features as the star forts of medieval Europe and later in the Americas. 
has the advanced water features including a clean spring diverted to the center of the structure. The geometric bastion walls built in the very mountain itself. The detail of it being the highest part of the region. Advanced masonry. Megalithic blocks weighing hundreds of tons. A centerpiece temple that was circular in shape with a dome on top right above this spring water feature. And of course the histories of lost civilizations from the Incas. One can only imagine what other walls and geometric patterns may have existed when this site was in its prime or may still be buried underneath it. We can only theorize as to the actual true age of it. There is much more to be studied here, and the more research we do the more we will discover about these lost prehistoric societies from mythology and oral history. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate the viewership and support from you guys. And I do read and appreciate all of your comments even if I forget to respond to them. If you want to support the channel even more you can go join the Patreon, it's really cheap, only $3 a month. And you'll get all these videos ad free as well as all the articles, videos, and information I consume when researching for these videos. There's a lot of cool stuff there, I'm sure you could get wrapped up in a few different rabbit holes from scrolling through what I've posted.